Hey everyone, thank you for joining me today. Um, so today I'm trying to get back into something that I used to do quite frequently, something that's been on my heart since May. Um, at the time this was placed on my heart, our whole life like got turned upside down. Um, I started helping with my uncle and his health care. Uh, which kept us on the busy side until the end of August when he passed. Um, so during this time, I've just been studying. I've been praying and taking care of him, taking care of my mom, um, which she's pretty self-sufficient, She, you know, but there's some things she needs help with. Uh, and of course, taking care of myself and my girls. Now, my girls are both grown women. Um, I'm very proud of both of them, but that's what we do. So as I'm starting this, I want to start off with an apology because I'm sure this video is probably going to be just as grainy. Um, once I post it as it is right now while it's recording because I'm using my computer and I don't know. I just don't like the built-in camera on this computer. I'm going to have to invest in a better one um, or drag back out my camcorder, which I used to record on and do it that way. But for right now, because this is just an introduction, we're going to use this computer and use this video camera. It'll be sufficient enough. The important isn't what you see but what you hear. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today, so we're going to start a study on Esther. And I'm going to read, and out of, out of the biblical reading, mine's going to read different than most of yours probably because of the translation that I use, um, which is the complete Jewish study Bible. This is one of my absolute favorite Bibles. Um, I got it from ChristianBooks.com, and it has been a true blessing to me because I'm somebody that I believe in taking the word back to its original content, uh, which is Hebrew, for, especially for the Old Testament, to gain that deeper understanding of what God is saying because so much is lost in translation. Well, with this Bible, that's been done for me. And they've got some excellent study notes in here, which I will be sharing. But as we start, I want to just share with you the introduction that this Bible gives to the book of Esther, which says, Babel, which is Hebrew for Babylon, was the Gentile world power that led Israel into captivity in three successive stages in 605, 597, and 587 BCE. In 539 BCE, Persia conquered Babel, after which Koresh, or Cyrus, issued the decree allowing the Jews to return to their homeland. Not all the Jews who had been taken captive elected to return, and many remained spread throughout the Persian Empire. The book of Esther records events that centered in Shushan, which is Hebrew for Susa, one of the four capitals of Persia, but affected all of the Jews residing in the Persian Empire, including those in Israel. Persian policy toward the Jews wavered. Koresh had allowed them to return to Israel, or again, that was um, Cyrus, had allowed them to return to Israel. But Daryavesh, which is Darius, had put a halt to the rebuilding of the temple until 520 BCE. At that time, Darius... I lost my place. At that time, Darius had put a halt. Um, no. After the completion. No, I'm sorry. Let me back, back up. I skipped a line. At that time, Darius rescinded this policy and allowed them to continue. After the completion of the temple, 
some Jewish enemies wrote an accusation against the Jews. Go figure. Doesn't that always happen? The book of Esther records that Ahash Verosh, or as is seen in most of our Bibles, Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, allowed a decree to be written a few years later, uh, circa 474 BCE, to destroy all Jews. Uh, we find that in Esther 3.7. However, on the basis of Queen Esther's intercession, he allows the Jews to defend themselves. We see that in chapters 8 and 9. Notably, the book of Esther does not directly describe God's activity of controlling, overruling, or guiding the events of the story, nor is God's name mentioned at all. The fact that so many Jews did not return to Israel points to their reluctance in identifying with the God of Israel. Perhaps the geographical displacement and the spiritual indifference of the Jews helps explain the absence of such terms as temple, sacrifice, Torah, prayer, and even God. Nevertheless, the reader increasingly senses God's activity through the author's use of irony and through the placing and reversal of events. The absence of God's name does not indicate lack of involvement. God is actually very involved and very near. I mean, think of it like, I'm going to stop right there a minute. Think of it like when we are going through one of the biggest trials or disappointments of our lives and we feel like God's nowhere to be found. But actually, he's carrying us through that storm, just like we see in the poem, Footprints in the Sand. He's carrying us. Now, with me, sometimes it's dragging. Sometimes, sometimes it's his footprints with a long drag mark. Um, because sometimes I just can't see it. I can't hear it. I can't picture it. I, I can't understand it. Um and it's a true test of my faith. And I have to get to that point of surrender where I just say, I can't do it because your word tells me that if I do it in and of myself, I'm going to mess it up. That's my paraphrase. The word actually says, lean not into your own understanding, but in all ways through prayer and supplication, give it to God. Again, a paraphrase. Um, and it is absolute truth. If I go in there and, and try to figure it out on my own, I just make a big old mess that he could have just took care of immediately if I would got out of the way and let him. So I'm, I'm learning. I'm trying to hold steady in that faith. I'm trying to practice what Paul taught us when he said that he could be content in all circumstances. Now, I'm working on learning that. I hope we all are, because it's not a one-time lesson. We get lots of tests to see how we do. Sometimes we pass those tests. Sometimes we have to retake them. I mean, that's just us. That's part of being human. That's not an excuse, because we should always strive, endeavor to surrender to God, because that's a form of worship. So let's get back to this reading. It's just a few more sentences here. Those who thought they were far from God find themselves under his scrutiny and care and are forced into action, which proves that God remains faithful and in sovereign control, even when the objects of his affection are unfaithful. How often are we? You know, that, that is something that I try to repent of every day is my unfaithfulness, my wavering faith, because I know he's got me. He's, he always had me. He's got me. And for those of you that don't know me, now that I've read the introduction, I guess I need to introduce myself now that I've introduced you to the book of Esther. I'm Regina Sanders. I am an ordained pastor. I am a certified life coach. Um, uh, 
I'm sorry, I have no. Chanel, no. I'm a beauty consultant or a beauty influencer for a pharmacy. I love their makeup, which you can't tell with this camera. But, um, so yeah, that's me in a nutshell. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. Uh, I'm a daughter. I wear the hat of so many titles um, and have a, you know, a small identity in each of them. Most importantly, I absolutely love God. I could not do this life without him. I would not even want to try. And I don't understand those that do. I'm sorry. I love you. I pray for understanding. You know, I, and don't say, well, it's because I've been through this hard time. Because I've been there. I've been angry with God. I have. I've buried two babies. You don't bury two babies and your father without some anger. But I still didn't go through it without God, even if I was angry with him, because he wouldn't leave me. He hasn't left you. It's not too late. You have an opportunity to enter a relationship with him, because let me tell you, God loves you like no other can. You can't love yourself as well as God loves you. He absolutely adores you to the point that he desires you. He is passionate about you. May we always be as passionate about him. Just a smidgen. I don't even think we can get close to how passionate he is about us. But we can strive. We can endeavor to get there. So, I, and again, I thank you for watching. Um, so now what I want to do is, um, I want to give you the outline of Esther as it is given here in the complete Jewish study Bible. So the first thing is the birth of a plot. The thing right up under that is, which would be A, is <clears throat> Esther becomes queen. And we find that in chapter one verse 1 through chapter 2, verse two, uh, verse 23, where Esther becomes the queen. The second thing we see um, is article B, which is Haman's plot. That is chapter 3, verse 1 through 15. So number 2 on this outline is the exposure of a plot. A, Appeal to Esther, chapters 4, verse 1 through 17. B, Esther goes before the king, chapter 5, verse 1 through 14. C, Mordecai is honored. And as you read, you'll see how important that is. Mordecai is honored. That's chapter 6, verse 1 through 14. D, is Haman's execution. That is chapters 7, verse 1 through chapter, uh, verse 1 through 10. Chapter 7, verse 1 through 10. So then we see item number 3 on this outline, which is the defeat of a plot. A, the king's decree, chapters 8, verse 1 through 17. B, the feast of Purim, which is still celebrated today um, around February um, in Jerusalem. That is the Feast of Purim. That's chapter 9, verse 1 through 32. And then we see item C, the promotion of Mordecai. So first he's honored, then he's promoted. And that is chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. So we're not going to read the whole book of Esther today. Um, but I do want to read chapter one, and I want to give you some study notes on that. And um, just from this study Bible. And then um, I've got, I've read the whole book, and I've been taking notes all along. So once we get through this, uh, the next video, we'll look at chapter two. Um, but right now we're going to go through chapter one.
the, the title of the book again is Esther. Verse 1. These events took place in the time of Azarharis. This is the Azarharis who ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days, when King Azarharis sat on his royal throne in Susa, the capital, in the third year of his reign, that he gave a banquet for all of his officials and couriers. courtiers. Um, so that is verses 1 through 3. And I want you to notice, um, as I highlight here because I thought I'd done this, I want you to notice certain things as we read this. It tells us um, what time that this event took place. And that was the time of Azar Harris. Uh, it tells us where he ruled. He ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. It's okay to write in your Bible. It's okay to highlight in your Bible. I give you permission. Uh, uh, my old Bible, y'all, I literally just had to take the cover back on because I have worn it out. Um, but And it wasn't a complete Jewish study Bible. It was the New American Standard. But that thing's got marks all the way through it just from studying and things that I need to remember, things I want to look back at, um, things that God has taught me each time I've gone back and read. Because we go through different levels of understanding. So, um, in verse 2, we see it was in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the capital. So, you know, that's an important time. This is telling us again. In those days, that's a mark of time. It tells us a geographical location which was Susa, the capital. Verse 3 tells us in the third year of his reign. This is also important. Um, I once did a number study um, or a word study, and number th the third year, number 3, was one of the things that I studied, everything to do with 3. Um, and I've learned that 3 is... A new begin well, it's not a new beginning, that's eight. There's a better way to word it. Three is about resurrection, it's about redemption. Jesus was in the tomb and raised on the third day. This is time about resurrection. So it's important to note that it was in the third year of his reign that he gave a banquet for all of his officials and courtiers. So it tells us what he gave. He gave a banquet, and it tells us who it was for, his officials and his courtiers. Three goes on to say, the army of Persia and Media, the nobles and the provincial officials were in attendance. So this tells us who came, who attended the party. It's important to note that. He displayed the, the first four, I'm sorry. He displayed the dazzling wealth of his kingdom and his great splendor for a long time. He did it for a long time. 180 days. So, 18 signify, in Hebrew signifies life. Um, it, when we look at this number, 180 days, not going back to Hebrew, but but just in our everyday life, um, most school years are a minimum of 180 days. Think about that. That's another significant. At the end of that time, 